Thank you, BJ. And now Dan Weiss will introduce today's speaker. Dan. Good afternoon. Our speaker today is the founder of Shadowbox Live. Pay attention to this. The largest resident theater company in America. Including 45 full-time artists. In addition to being a talented composer and musician, Steve is one of the most savvy and likable business people you'll ever meet. Here to talk about the arts as an economic driver, please welcome Steve Geiger. Thank you very much for allowing me to come and speak with you today. Um, you know, I don't often get out of my cage at the theater because we're really busy. I think that's half the reason. The other half is people don't trust what I'll have to say to them. I don't know where that comes from other than my reputation. Um, I am the executive director of Shadowbox Live. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, have been for the entirety of our 25 year existence. When we got started, we were basically squatters in a downtown warehouse. Um, we had no reason to be where we were. We had no particular audience for what we were doing. And we uh, had lots and lots of debt that we were accruing and trying to figure out how in the world we were going to pay back. Today, as Dan mentioned, we are the largest resident theater company in America. Our budget this year is $3.5 million, which makes us the second largest arts organization in the city. And I'm asked routinely, how in the world we accomplished that in just 25 years? Because I'll be honest with you, there are lots and lots of arts organizations who started about the same time that we did, who either folded or are still very, very, very tiny organizations. And the answer that I give is both honest and obnoxious. We worked harder than anybody I know. At Shadowbox, the idea is basically, this is a life. This isn't a hobby. It's not something we do occasionally. Those 45 people who work full-time at Shadowbox, this is what they do all day, every day. They don't also work somewhere else doing something else. They don't have another focus in their lives. Most of them would tell you that they also don't have much of a life outside. <laughs> but that's the price you pay to be really, really good at what you do in a town like Columbus. So when I say it in a town like Columbus, I actually mean that with extraordinary affection. Because they gave us the opportunity to fail spectacularly for many, many, many years before we started figuring out how to do it right. And while we were failing, they were still willing to buy tickets, still willing to support us. I think there was this insistence that anybody as passionate and crazy as we were must eventually get it right. And that has paid off. It's paid off in spades. The uh, American Theater Group did a study two years ago of all the mid-sized theaters in this country and came out with some statistics. The average mid-sized theater in America earned $553,000 a year all in. We did $3.4 million last year. The average theater in America generates $534,000 in contributions. We accepted only 200000 last year. Why? Because we don't take any money from the city or the state or any governmental organization. It's a principal issue. Our basic philosophy is, if it's worth doing, people will pay you to do it. There are, of course, incredibly important exceptions to this. You cannot have a world-class symphony unless it's supported by public funding. You just can't do it because the symphony is too expensive. And you can't just simply have ticket sales that will cover the $9 million that the symphony cost. They did $2 million in revenue last year, which is great for them. But somebody had to make up that $7 million difference. Shadowbox doesn't have that issue because what we offer is a very practical sort of thing. We understand that our 45 artists can and do perform 535 times a year. 
The average theater produces 94 performances a year. The average theater has eight productions a year. Last year we did 21. Why? Because that's the passion. If you're an artist, the joy is creating art. So why stop at eight? <laughs> we've got the time, we've got the passion. It's what we like to do. So we do, and we do it in excess, I'm willing to admit. The average performing arts organization last year served 18,124 <coughs> patrons. We served 92,530. It's a difference in attitude more than anything else. When you talk to folks that are true professionals in my industry, they will tell you that the biggest challenge that they have is repetitions. It is very difficult to get up every day and go do cats. That's a reality for a lot of people. Their dream is to get to Broadway and perform or produce or whatever it may be. And you think that sounds like a really good idea until year eight. <laughs> You're still doing the same show, the same role, same songs every single day. I'm here to tell you that I do not know a single person in that industry, in that city, doing those kinds of shows that is happy with their lifestyle. On the other hand, people ask me all the time, how in the world can you have 17 people in your organization, Steve, that have been with you for 20 years? The answer is certainly not, I pay them a lot of money. Like every arts organization, we're broke. We're always broke. But we're in the black. <clears throat> the answer, on, on the other hand, excuse me, <clears throat> the answer is that we have an opportunity for people to be creative that they simply don't have anywhere else. <clears throat> they get to be in more shows. They get to have creative input in every single thing they do. They can dance. They can sing. They can act. They can play an instrument. They can write. In addition to doing all the administrative sides of our business. Because that's our model. Our model basically says everybody has the heart of Da Vinci. You can do it all if you choose to, if you want to, if you believe in yourself. And they do. And they do it at an extraordinarily high level. You are a good man. Thank you, my brother. Try my best every day. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not all. Last year, Shadowbox gave back to the Columbus community $250,000. Take a look around at the arts organizations you're familiar with and ask them when was the last time they wrote a check to somebody else. I guarantee I know the answer. They didn't. It's not because they don't have big hearts. It's because they just don't have the wherewithal to do so. Part of our mission all along was to do more than merely support our own art. It was to support the community in a broad and general way. Between community service, which is hours that we give to schools, between auctions, which is tickets that we provide, and cash, which is people that buy tickets where we return half of the ticket purchase value to the organization that put together the uh, event. A quarter of a million just last year. In addition to that, we put together an educational program at Shadow, started six years ago. And it started with 12 students from a STEM school in Columbus. And we invited those 12 students to get up on stage with us and to go through the process and learn how to truly sing like a professional or play an instrument or act or whatever the case may be. So we did a show, and it was wildly successful. Audiences ate it up. They felt, they believed in their heart that they were seeing these young people succeed at a level they couldn't succeed otherwise. We did it with STEM school students because those students don't have a lot of art in their trainings, and they need it. It's desperately important. Why? In Silicon Valley, all of the big businesses there were surveyed. And it turns out that 40% of the CEOs of the largest organizations in Silicon Valley are directed by CEOs who have 
traditional STEM backgrounds. Not too surprising, I suppose. 60% were directed by people whose backgrounds were in the arts or humanities. Why? Because the arts and the humanities teach critical thinking. STEM studies, wildly important. Wildly important to our future as a, as a society. But you know what? You need critical thinking skills to do the creative work that really puts STEM to work. Science, technology, engineering, math, you can't have our world without them. You also can't have our world without people who can communicate those ideas effectively. And if you spend all day, every day, with your nose buried in a book or a computer, your communication skills are going to suffer. Small children, and I'm talking age three and down, have the ability in their first years to function like geniuses when it comes to divergent thinking. You ask them, what all can you do with a paper clip? They'll come up with 25 ideas. 98% is the number that scientists give us. By the time they're six years old, that number is down to 33%. By the time they're 20, that number is down to 10%. At our age, the number is 2%. What happened? The answer is we get locked into paths in terms of how we think. It's not because we're horrible human beings or stupid. It's the life we live, particularly the school that we embrace, tends to challenge us to think in narrow alleys. They say, here's what I need you to learn in order to succeed on this standardized test. Go. The arts are the opposite. You can't learn to sing in a standardized way, or play an instrument in a standardized way, or anything that has to do with the arts. So, over the last 60 years, we've gotten more and more and more aggressive about the training programs that we have available for, available for students. This year, our STEM program served 50 students. We have a boot camp program that will happen this year for uh, three weeks, which will serve another 60 students. We have intern programs that serve 20 students a year. We have pre-professional programs where we bring young people into the ensemble and work shows with them. So far this year, we've already worked with 12 students. In the past six years, we've worked with over 2,000 students to give them a richer experience in the arts. And I'm not talking merely about students that have come to see shows. I don't mean that at all. That's a completely separate arm of what we're doing. I'm talking about students that we've actually brought into our program, provided training to, and given opportunities to on stage. It's a critical part of who and what we are because we believe that we have to build our audience. We have to build our society. A lot of people wondered why we went to Easton when we made that move about 15 years ago. Well, it didn't help that we burned down downtown and we needed a new home. <laughs> And it certainly was a big plus that Yarmir Steiner, the guy that put Easton together for less, was a big fan and felt that they needed something out there to ground them a little bit so it wasn't just Disneyland. But it was also true that we felt that it was interesting to, to experiment with the notion of can you put an organization like this into that kind of environment? And the answer is mixed. Yes, you can. And you can certainly succeed at some level, but there are limits to what you can do. At the end of the day, everyone asks themselves, how good can it be it's in a mall? They're not wrong. I know that I am that obnoxious guy that would ask that same question. So, we started looking around very quickly for a way to get out of that mall. And we found a new home downtown. Bill Schottenstein, who uh, spent five and a half years vetting me personally, to decide whether he wanted to do business with a guy in the arts. And I understand it, because in most arts organizations, the way that you pay your lease is you go to your board and you say, I need some more money for the lease. That's a very tough way to run a business, and it's not our way to run the business. Our business is, let's sell some more tickets and pay for that lease. And that's worked. It's worked for all 25 of our years. We've never not been in the black. So once Bill decided that we were legitimate, we made the deal, we got a new home downtown, we're in the uh, brewery district on Front Street, at the old Worley building. Gorgeous, gorgeous building. And it is a fabulous home for us. It has allowed us not just to expand our programming to the numbers I was describing to you earlier, but it's also allowed us to interact with our community in a completely different way. You know, when you're at Easton, 
and you walk out your front door and you talk to people, what you're not going to talk to is somebody who owns the business. The owner of all the businesses at Easton is some several thousand miles away, either in New York or in L.A. In the brewery district, I can walk out my door and go any direction, a hundred yards, and talk to ten different people who own their business. In the brewery district, if we've got empty buildings, I can move Shadowbox into our space and inspire other people to take a chance. Since we have been there, 230 new apartments have been built within a hundred yards of our facility. Five new restaurants have opened within a hundred yards of our facility. And ten new creative business types have moved into the organization within a hundred yards. And every one of them will tell you it's because Shadowbox moved in. Because we took a chance on the neighborhood. They knew, A, I was going to bring 2,000 people a week to that neighborhood. B, Somebody was willing to take a big risk because it was a $3 million renovation that was done on our building so that we could put a theater into it. And C, they already know the kind of commitment that Shadowbox makes to every single thing that it does and that that was bound to bleed over. First thing that I did when I got down there is I told my marketing director, Julie Klein, the lovely and talented Julie Klein, that she had to be the new president of the Brewery District Trade Association. She was actually okay with that. Um, and she still is the president today, and it's a very active and vital organization that's starting to make a difference in the neighborhood. Every arts organization has the capacity to be an economic driver in that way. Every organization isn't guaranteed to be that, but if they're passionate, they have powerful leadership, they can make that kind of a difference in any neighborhood. You know, I hear all the time, why in the world should I support another arts organization? It's a good question. I I agree. You should ask. But the answer to that question can only be arrived at by going and seeing exactly what they do, talking to them to find out exactly who they are, and see where their real passions lie. Because a great arts organization has the ability to affect lives. Literally. They can make your life better. They can make the lives of your children better better. They can make a community stronger. And that's a big part of what Shadowbox is advocating for. That it's not okay to just do business as usual. The only thing that's okay is to constantly push the envelope. I'll give you a couple examples of what I mean by that. You know, a long time ago in Columbus, five whole years, there wasn't a whole lot of collaboration happening in the arts. It was very rare to find two arts organizations working together. And then we got together with the ballet and did a show called Seven Deadly Sins. Middle of the summer at the Capitol Theater. The ballet traditionally sells out the Nutcracker every year. In their 35 years, that's the only show that they've ever sold out. Until Seven Deadly Sins with Shadowbox at the Capitol Theater. Not only did we sell out the show, we had to add a show. It was an extraordinary success. Very shortly after that, we put together another symphony ballet, and we did a performance with Verb Ballets up in Cleveland this past year. Sold out the show. That show is coming to Columbus. It'll be here May 15th at the Palace Theater. Um, Hopefully you'll join us. The Verb Ballets is an extraordinary organization. Very young, very powerful, very, very good at what they do. The music is in my opinion, fabulous, but that's because I wrote most of it, so, you know, how how good that opinion is. Um, But I think it's an exceptional show. We also, last year, entered into a a collaboration with the Columbus Museum of Art. And people would say, what in the world are you going to do with the Museum of Art? Answer, we got to look at their entire collection. And I'm talking about their permanent collection, the parts they own. We selected 21 pieces from their permanent collection, We took high-resolution photographs and video of these 21 pieces. Then we wrote a 21-song cycle. And in two weeks, we opened that show. And the show is called Gallery of Echoes. And it is essentially all of these brilliant works of art, Monet, Picasso, Bierstadt, all of those works of art put to music, some with dance, 
some with vocals, some with spoken word, some just to appreciate the glory of the, the, the works themselves. We explore the work at super close-up range. We pull back and let you see the whole thing. We give you context for what this work means. We had the incredible joy of meeting with um, Dominique Vasquez, who is the uh, primary curator. And he took us through the museum and told us about these works as we were walking through. And it changed my entire point of view on the works themselves.